Hello, everybody. Over the next 15 minutes, we will discuss uh, three state-of-the-art topics in prostate MRI as of 2022. Here are my disclosures. So we know that the uh, prostate cancer diagnosis pathway is a risk-based pathway. There is an initial clinical assessment of risk, and then there's a second assessment of risk after performing an MRI in men who are thought to be of intermediate and high risk of prostate cancer. And we use MRI because the higher the suspicion on an MRI, the greater is the likelihood of clinically significant cancers. But if you look at the bottom, you can see that about 45% of men with a positive MRI, pyrex 3.5, do not have a clinically significant cancer, which means we have too many men with positive scans without a clinically significant cancer. And there are other problems with the MRI pathway, including a large uh, degree of inter and intra-observer variability and radiological burnout because of additional tasks that radiologists have to do, including outlining tasks, which are often unfunded activities. So with this in mind, we need to discuss three topics. And first is, how do you pick the right patient for a MRI? Now, typically, this type of man would benefit from an MRI, a normal DRE, a slightly elevated PSA. But there are other men who also benefit from a prostate MRI, including those men on active surveillance or those patients who have had MRI in the past and have had either a negative histology or a negative MRI and the PSA continues to rise. So these are two additional groups of men who benefit from a prostate MRI. You can see that the commonality between all of these patients is the prevalence. And the prevalence is between uh, 20 and 50 percent. So these men with this kind of prevalence gain four benefits. And the first, and I guess the most important benefit, is it reduces the number of men undergoing a biopsy and therefore reduces the diagnosis of indolent cancers. And this speaks to the negative predictive value of MRI. But there are, but there is more accurate targeted biopsies and grading and a non-inferiority in the detection of clinically significant disease, which speaks to the positive predictive value or the uh, rule in ability of MRI. Now, here I'm trying to illustrate to you uh, the benefits against the prevalence. And you'll see on the top left, we've got a graph that shows you the benefit at a prevalence of 20%. And on the right, we see the benefits that could arise from a prevalence of 50%. And what you notice is that biopsy avoidance is greatest in people who have the lowest prevalence. And that's the graph on the left-hand side. And you can see that the people who benefit most from the reduced detection of clinically significant diseases, again, at the lower prevalence, at uh, 20%. So if you look on the right-hand side and look at the difference in the detection of indolent cancers, you can see there's no difference between a systematic biopsy and a MRI-targeted biopsy. So you can see how benefits scale according to prevalence. Now, recently, we have had the introduction of a new group of patients who seem to benefit from the role of MRI. And these are men who undergo primary screening with an elevated PSA, usually above three nanograms per ml. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine recently. I'd like you to focus on the graph on the right hand side. And you can see that men having an MRI following a raised PSA in the primary screening setting can avoid a biopsy to a greater extent compared to systematic biopsy. And you can see how there are fewer benign diagnoses, there are fewer insignificant cancers, and there is about an equivalence of the detection of clinically significant disease. Next, let's pick up on how do you improve the benefits from prostate MRI while minimizing harms, remembering that benefits arise from true results and harms from false results. So if you look at the benefits, the true negative benefits, you can see this is pretty consistent, the graph on the left-hand side. 
and these are 10 centers in the UK, and you can see there, there is very little variation in the negative predictive value. Whereas if you look at the harms that arise from false positives, what you notice is there's a great inconsistency in biopsy yields, and these are mostly US centers from 25 US centers, and you can see how variable the positive predictive value is. So how do we go about minimizing false positive harms while maintaining the true negative benefits? There are essentially four strategies one could use. What I'd like to do today is to focus on the second strategy. The second strategy is using MRI with clinical factors. Specifically, I'd like to talk to you about PSA density. Now, all of you will have seen this table in the latest EAU guidelines showing you the prevalences of clinically significant disease according to the PIRAD score and PSA densities. I've just deconstructed the table into this graph. And you can see how on the top left, the higher the PIRAD score, the greater is the prevalence. The higher is the PSA density, the greater is the prevalence. And the combinations of these are shown at the bottom. So if we were to look at the graph and look at the table on your right hand side, if you were to biopsy just pyrads three, fours and fives, you can see that 38% of men avoid a biopsy, missing 6% of cancers. And you can see that the false positive rate it goes down from 63% to 45%. Now, if you were to then say, okay, I'm going to biopsy only men with pyrads 4 and 5, with a pyrads 3 with a higher PSA density, what would be the benefits? You can see that the number of men avoiding a biopsy changes from 38% to 45%. So that's an improvement. You can see that the number of false positives goes down from 45% to 39%. So a 6% improvement in false positivity rates. But of course, you would lose 2% in um, the, the non-detection of clinically significant disease, going from 6 to 8%. But the 8% is still below the EAU threshold of 10%. If you looked on the left-hand side again, you can see where the 10% cutoff is. So suppose you were only going to biopsy men with a greater than 10% chance of clinically significant disease. What then would be the benefits. You see, you'll be biopsying men with pyrus 1 and 2 with a higher PSA density. Well, if you look at this, you can see that the number of men avoiding the biopsy is 38%. So no different to pyrus 3, 4, and 5. You can see the number of cancers missed is about the same, 5, 6%. But you see that we can reap the benefits of fewer false positives, as you can see in the right hand graph. So it looks as though we really should be mixing PSA density with the PIRAD score. Lastly, I'd like to talk to you about AI and what role it could play in data acquisition and for automated reading of prostate MRI. Now, clearly there are a number of roles for prostate AI, but what I'd like to do is just focus on two areas, data acquisition first. So here is the latest um, development in prostate AI. And on the top, you've got the conventional images. And on the bottom, you've got AI accelerated images. And you'll see how the times for the acquisition of the T2 sequences and the diffusion imaging is roughly halved. So if you look at the zoom it or the diffusion sequence, you can see before the use of AI, it's three minutes and 50 seconds. Afterwards, it's two minutes and five seconds. And you can apply similar benefits to the T2 sequences, meaning that the whole acquisition goes down from 15 minutes to eight minutes. So your appointment time can go down from 20 minutes to maybe 15 minutes. So this is the power of using AI to accelerate the uh, acquisition. Next, let's talk about the image interpretation. Now, when an AI 
tries to interpret um, multiparametric MRI, it has to undergo a number of steps, and this is called the multi-stage architecture. The multi-stage architecture essentially segments, finds the gland, segments the gland, segments the zones, number one. Number two, it detects the lesions and localizes them. Number three, it characterizes the lesion by the level of suspicion of a particular lesion. Number four, it reduces false positives, and this is called false alarm reductions. And finally, it maps the whole thing. And you can see this illustrated on the images on the right-hand side. Now, if you were to employ such a AI, does it improve the reading of radiologists? And the answer to that is it does. And you can see that uh, data presented here for seven radiologists. You can see that an unaided radiologist improves his performance with an AI to detect pyrites 4 and 5 lesions. So he is helped by a AI to say something is pyrites 4 and 5. The other thing you'll notice is that the inter-reader concordance is improved. So there's decreased variability. And of course, there are some improvements in the speed of reading also, which is also worth having. The question is, does this then generalize to the improved detection of clinically significant disease? And what is that performance? And that is shown here. What we notice is the AIROC curve is shown on the right hand side of the graph. And you can see that the AI performance at the moment matches the performance of a general radiologist. In other words, in this illustration, the general radiologist that were taking part in the MRI first study. These were at 16 centers in France. And you can see that the performance level is in fact less than for expert central readers. So at a 90% sensitivity, you can see the false positive rate is 50%, which is what we said at the very beginning. But for the 4M radiologists, who are two center radiologists, you can see that at 90% sensitivity, they had a false positive rate of 30%. So it matches a general radiologist at the time, doesn't quite match the um, pickup of a specialist radiologist at this time. So the questions you should ask yourself before you buy an AI is, do you want a radiologic assistant or an expert system? The performance levels will be different. What is it that you want the AI to do exactly? Do you want it to exclude patients who are highly unlikely to have clinically significant disease? Then the performance matrix, uh, metrics are different. Do you want a lesion, uh, do you want an AI to point out lesions that are most likely to be clinically significant? cancers? Or do you want a AI that helps you with manage uh, to manage your biopsies? Uh, and again, that will be very different. And you can see how the the what you have to assess in terms of the AI performance is different. The other thing you need to think about is, does it work with your data? Will it integrate into your workflow? And does it have additional features? So for example, is it possible to get outputs with the false positive reduction engine on and the false positive reduction engine off, which may be appropriate for patients who are, say, biopsy averse or patients who are cancer averse. So it's it, it, to see if all of these features actually exist. So these are my final take home points. There is no doubt that risk stratification before an MRI helps optimize the benefits from the MRI, resulting from its rule-out ability. We are currently focused on improving the positive predictive value, particularly its variability and the impacts on the false alarm rates. You should use an MRI as the guide for biopsy. And the biopsies should be performed according to the patient's tolerance to false positive results. AIs are performing at the moment at an equivalent level to a average radiologist with the average level of false alarms and false reassurances. 
and the current role is as a diagnostic aid and a biopsy management aid. So what we can say is currently a high quality multidisciplinary working remains the gold standard for prostate cancer diagnosis. I hope you found some of these comments useful for your practice. Thank you very much.